Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to understand who we are, to see ourselves, to meet ourselves, that we might know how important, how crucial, how significant Jesus is for our hearts, minds, and lives. We ask in his name, amen. It's kind of a strange text, don't you think? There are people at the Passover feast who witness Jesus' miracles and they believe in him. And yet, the text tells us Jesus didn't trust them because he knew what was in people. He knew people way down to the depths of their being. So we best do some explaining. Jesus wants us to know that we are fundamentally flawed, that we have deep-seated problems. I think the best way to explain that is go back to the beginning, Genesis 3, when Satan tempts Adam and Eve and says, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, good and evil is not in an ethical or a moral sense. It's more of in a personal, what I call an existential, experiential sense. What happened to Adam and Eve is they become very self-focused. They become turned in on themselves. They become self-centered. And so what they're looking at is, what's good for me? What's bad? I want the good. I want to avoid the bad. So I've done this in Bible class, but I think you can handle it. I'll just give you some options and you say to yourself or say out loud whether it's good or bad. Money. Now remember, you got to be self-interested and self-focused. You got to be turned in on yourself. Money. Woohoo, that's good. That's good. I like money. Poverty. Ah, uh, no, I'm not going to go there. A life without much difficulty. Hmm, I like that. A life of struggles. No, not really. And you go down the list and we finally come to miracles. Do people want miracles in their lives? Spectacular things that solve a problem or overcome a difficulty. Perhaps an illness or a dread situation, a terminal disease. Yeah, we want that. Suffering, struggle. No, I'm not sure I want that. If you understand this about your own nature, you begin to understand that miracle-based faith is pretty superficial. It only looks at the surface. It only looks at the outward circumstances of our lives. Miracle-based faith is not that kind of deep, penetrating faith that pierces our minds and takes up residence in our hearts. It's not the kind of faith where Jesus becomes essential and necessary for our lives, especially in the difficult times, especially when we're going through struggles. There's something fundamentally wrong with us. We would love to see spectacular miracles in our lives. I remember when I was on the 
deal and I was being wheeled into the surgery room for my first hip surgery and I said, Lord, if you want to, you can heal this right now. <laughs> Miracle would have been really welcome at that time. Instead, I went through surgery and six weeks of walking around on crutches and a year of a sore hip. You know, you can tell if a person has miracle-based faith really simply. If the miracles are gone and the faith is gone, that's a clear indicator. I hope that you are able to look at yourselves. Incidentally, the title of the children's message is a, a famous statement by Socrates, and it takes a lifetime of study to really figure it out. But Socrates says, know yourself. Know what you're made of. Know the essential you. Introduce yourself to yourself. Not on a superficial level, but really go and look at who you are and the desires and the hopes and the dreams you have. Another thing that indicates miracle-based faith is adversity. I don't know if any of you remember way back, just a couple of weeks after 9-11, there was a prayer service in the National Cathedral. And President Bush says, adversity introduces us to ourselves. You learn much more about the essential you when you're going through dark and difficult times than you do when everything's smooth as silk. Another thing, a lot of people, when they are in a situation of distress, they all of a sudden say, I need God. But most often it doesn't last. Again, 9-11, remember how the churches just exploded with people searching and looking for answers? And as soon as they discovered that God wasn't going to give them a quick fix, that going through the struggle was part of the process to help them understand who they really were so that they could begin to grasp who Jesus really is. The second thing in the outline, a sure, clear indication of miracle-based faith is when we do face those times of difficulty and struggle, those times of stress and depression, how do you react? Most people try to fix themselves. They think if I just put my shoulder to the wheel and I tough it out, I can make it through this. I can fix myself. Self-help books and success Gurus will tell you, try harder. Unfortunately, many Christian pastors, that's their go-to mantra also. Okay, so you're struggling. You, you don't know how to extricate yourself from this. Try harder. You know, if you really follow the biblical rules and principles, God will help you. But it's conditional. You've got to do the following rules and principles, and then God will help you. What this text is telling us is Jesus wants to really drive us deep into our own psyche, our own mental operations, our own way of seeing ourselves. Do we just say to God, I'm helpless and I need help? Or do we actually say, I'm helpless and I need help and I can't do it? I really am confident you're working through this situation 
but Lord, I need something to grasp, something to hold on to, something that will give me a certainty that you're on my side. You know, all of us, and again, if you look in the mirror of your psyche, you will realize that the problem beneath all of our problems, the reason we label things as good and other things as bad and we seek the good and avoid the bad is because deep down we're insecure. We don't feel that we have intrinsic worth and value, significance, meaning, and purpose in our lives. And that's where Jesus comes in. That's how Jesus can fix our situations so that we can handle them no matter how difficult. That's where Jesus steps on the stage and says, I've got something that will give your life security no matter what. The Apostle Paul says it this way. He says, stop striving the God who justifies the ungodly has made you righteous. He has given you his righteousness. In Christ, you're totally accepted. You're unconditionally loved. And you're forever forgiven. When we realize that the the root problem behind all of our problems is our sense of insecurity and that we're spending our lives, whether it's in a religious way or in a secular way, we're trying to find something that gives us a sense of worth, gives us a sense that we're valuable. We're trying to find someone who will love us unconditionally. We're trying to find someone who will stick with us through thick and thin, even when we disappoint them. We're trying to find someone who can enter the struggle with us and say, I've been there. Here's what you need. You need me. You need the one who took your place and received your punishment and was scourged mercilessly and cruelly crowned with thorns pressed down upon his head and nailed, nailed to a wooden cross. And he says, I did that in your place so that now you can receive my righteousness. You can receive eternal worth, significance, never-ending love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Enable us to look at ourselves and to understand ourselves so that our faith is not superficial, but it is deep and strong. And that our faith communicates to us Jesus Christ, his love, his forgiveness, his acceptance of us. We ask this in his name. Amen.